Welcome. My name is Jessica Ellington and I am an executive pastry chef. I've worked in the industry a little over a decade in some of Chicago's top restaurants and bakeries and now I run my own pastry consulting business. So I help other restaurants and bakeries with their recipe development and staff training. Uh, but part of the time, I also like to teach classes to folks like you because I love pastry. I think that everybody should give it a try somewhere along the lines it became very intimidating and I want to take some of that away. I'm going to break everything down for you step by step so that it makes sense for you. As you're making these macarons at home, when you make them, make sure you're tagging the library on social media and you can find me on social media at Sweet Bee Chicago. So I think we should get started. Today we're making French macarons. Now, French macarons have a reputation of being very finicky and they are. But I'm going to break down everything step by step. We're going to troubleshoot along the way so that you can make them at home. Um, macarons are very subject to the humidity uh, in the air. So these are really great to make in the winter time. Not that you can't make them in the summertime, but make them a few times in the winter time so that when it comes to the summer, you know how to kind of troubleshoot and work around that extra humidity in the air. There is a good amount of prep work that goes into making the macarons. So before you get started, make sure you're following that prep list. You can't just on a whim decide you wanna make macarons and then go ahead and, and make them that day. You have to do a little bit of prep work ahead of time. And I've outlined all of the steps of what that prep work is. So the first thing is we're gonna separate egg whites. So I've already done this. This is the type of container that I like to keep my egg whites in. After I separate the egg whites and the egg yolks, I put them in this container and I put them in the refrigerator I leave the lid on, but you could do a container with, um, with plastic wrap on top and just poke a few holes in the top of it as well. But you want to leave it just slightly ajar or have that plastic with some holes in it so that the egg whites can dry out a little bit. Um, with the lid open, some of the moisture or water that's in the egg whites is going to evaporate out and it's going to make it easier for us or better for us when we go to make our meringue for our macarons a little bit later. So this needs to go in the fridge two days ahead of time so that it can fully dry out. And then before you make the macarons, you just want to make sure you bring this to room temperature. So I pulled this out about 30 minutes ago um, to let this start coming to room temperature. Now the other thing we need to do is get our dry ingredients ready. So our dry ingredients are almond flour and powdered sugar. So the best types of almond flours that you're going to be able to find are either going to be Bob's Red Mill uh, the extra fine which is available in most grocery stores um, and sometimes you can also find the blue diamond almond flour version um, those are both really good almond flours they're super fine which is what you really want um, and both of them can be found online as well so before you make your macarons you want to get everything scaled out for your uh, powdered sugar and your almond flour and let that sit out so that it has a chance to dry out as well so i did this uh, two days ago, giving it plenty of time to dry out. And before I got started, I'm just going to sift everything. So I've got just a little bit of almond flour left in here. I'm pushing it through my fine mesh sieve. If you don't have a fine mesh sieve at home, you can also just put everything through the um, through your food processor and give it about 15 pulses. And what that's going to do, it's going to eliminate any lumps that are in there and just make sure it's extra fine. What we're trying to do here when we're sifting it is making sure that there aren't any big clumps of almond that are left in the in the mixture uh, or powdered sugar. So you just want to push everything through. If you end up with some um, of your dry mixture that just won't go through but it isn't particularly large and isn't particularly lumpy, feel free to just dump that right into the bowl. We're just looking for large pieces of almond or just large lumps of powdered sugar that just won't break down. So if those are left in in the sieve when you're done, just discard those. But if everything's just really fine, it's just too big to go through the sieve, it's okay to just dump that in. And now with our prep work out of the way, we are gonna get started on making our macarons. So I have my, I have everything already scaled out and ready to go. So when I'm working at home, I highly recommend using a digital scale. And I know some people are a little weary about using a digital scale because they've never used it before and they really prefer cups and teaspoons. And if that's what you have at home, that's fine. I give the recipe to you both ways, um, but I wanna talk about why I'm such a fan of using a digital scale. 
it's much more accurate. If you're the type of person that isn't having consistent results with your baking at home, it could come down to how you're measuring your ingredients in your cups and your teaspoons and your tablespoons. But when you're using a digital scale, 100 grams is 100 grams is 100 grams. If we all took a cup of flour and measured it, we would get different weights of that flour. Um, and with the scale, it's just always gonna be the same. So it could be how you're measuring your ingredients. Uh, let me talk a little bit about how a scale works. So most of them, uh, you turn it on, and then they have a couple other buttons. One is a unit button, so you can go between grams and ounces. And then there's also a button that says tear, and some scales say zero, but uh, they, they work the same. And what that does is, when you turn your scale on and you put your bowl on top of your scale, you hit that tear or that zero button, and it's gonna take it back down to zero. So you don't have to add whatever your weight is of your ingredient to, this, to the weight of the bowl to get your measurement. So there's no math required. Uh, and then if you wanna add another ingredient on top of that, you just hit the tear button again, and you can scale your next ingredient right on top. So it's gonna be a little bit faster. You're also gonna dirty less dishes. I hate doing dishes. So that was like a big selling point for me, um, is that you're not gonna dirty all the cups and the teaspoons and the tablespoons. And when you have a recipe that uses, you know, a tablespoon for honey, and then you need a tablespoon for, I don't know, cornstarch or something later on in the recipe, then you have to wash the tablespoon. So this is why I just prefer measuring all of my ingredients. It's so much faster. And you can find really, really good scales online for not very expensive. For like $15, you can get a really good quality scale. So I highly recommend if you haven't tried measuring or weighing your ingredients on a scale um, that you give it a shot. But if you're not there yet, no worries. I give it to you both ways. So macarons are, um, when you break it down, really very simple. We're gonna make what's called a French meringue, which is we're gonna whip our egg whites with some sugar, and then we're gonna fold it into our dry mixture, which is our powdered sugar and our almond flour. So at the most basic level, it's a French meringue with some dry ingredients folded in. It's very simple. But there is some technique involved in that, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go over that. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So we've got our egg whites in the bowl. I've already weighed them out. I've got my handheld mixer. Um, if you don't have a handheld mixer, you can use a stand mixer with a whip attachment or vice versa. Either one is fine. Uh, we're going to use a handheld mixer. So a French meringue is uh, just where we're going to whip these egg whites. Uh, and then once they're quite foamy and holding the tracks of our, uh, our whisk here in the egg whites, we're going to add a little bit of cream of tartar and salt. Okay, so every recipe that we're making today is gonna to have a little bit of salt in it. And it's not to make them salty, it's not like salted chocolate or salted caramel, it's just for flavor. So if you cook at home, you probably put salt in your cooking because it makes food taste better. It doesn't make it salty, it just makes it taste really good. And the same thing is true with baking. So everything's gonna have just a little bit of salt in it, which is just gonna make everything taste a little bit better, but it's not gonna make it taste salty, I promise. And then after our cream of tartar and our salt are mixed in, then we're gonna start adding our sugar. And the cream of tartar in the recipe uh, is, or is in the recipe because it's a little bit acidic. And that acid in the egg whites is gonna help stabilize the proteins in the egg whites to make a really stable meringue for us. So I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna start on medium speed. Now I'm not starting on high speed because I want this meringue to come up slowly. So what we're doing right now is forming a network of bubbles in our meringue. And that's what meringue is. It's just a network of all kinds of bubbles uh, in the meringue. And when you start on a slower speed, the bubbles that you're making are gonna be smaller. And when you were on a higher speed, the bubbles are gonna be bigger. And the reason that's important is that you can imagine a pyramid of all of these different kinds of bubbles. So, when we start mixing in our dry ingredients later, those bubbles are going to deflate. And the smaller the bubble, the less deflation there's going to be. And the larger the bubble, the bigger or the more deflation is going to happen. So when you're whipping on medium speed, it's going to produce a more stable meringue. So right now it's just getting a little bit foamy, starting to get a little bit lighter in color. I still want it to be lighter still. 
and I want to be able to see some scratch marks from where my my beaters are going through the holes. So it's going to take a couple of minutes to get there. You don't want to rush this process. You want to make sure that you have the bubble structure already starting to form before we add the salt and the cream of tartar so that you can get full volume out of your ingredients. So it's getting lighter still. Still has just a little bit of yellow to it. Just a few more seconds. The bubbles inside of my bowl went from very uh, large to now very, very fine. Okay, right now we're at a good color. Starting to get very, very foamy. And when I'm uh, when I turn my hand mixer on, I can see that there's some track marks being marked. Right here. Okay, and that's what we're going for. I'm gonna go ahead and add my salt and my cream of tartar, and then we're gonna let this go again on medium speed until we get a soft peak in our meringue. So as your meringue is forming, you're going to notice the mixture in your bowl starting to kind of gloss to your satin color. That's really good. The meringue is starting to pile up on itself as I see those track marks even better inside of my meringue. Okay. I'm going to turn this down and we're just going to check the consistency. So I'm getting a peak on my beaters and it's a nice soft peak. So we can start adding the sugar. Now when we add the sugar, we don't want to add it all at once. It's going to over, overwhelm the meringue that we've made so far and deflate it and it's never going to really um, reach its full volume uh, when we do it that way. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but we're going to add our sugar a tablespoon at a time. And so I've got my sugar in two little ramekins here so that it's easier for me to sort of keep track of how much I'm adding. Uh, we're adding um, about six tablespoons of sugar, and so I know I need to add three additions of this one and then three additions of the second one. It's just easier for me to eyeball it that way. You can also just put it in a bowl and just grab a tablespoon and just add a tablespoon at a time. So, mix this back on, medium speed. I'm going to add a tablespoon, I'm going to eyeball it, a tablespoon of this sugar that's in here. It's going to be a third of this container. I don't want to dump it in. I'm going to sort of slowly sprinkle it in. I don't want to dump it in because I don't want the weight of all of that sugar to just make the nine inside of my weight. I'm going to let this get fully mixed in about 30 seconds before we use the turn before adding the and you're going to see that the volume of your meringue is going to start to get bigger inside of your bowl. It's going to still remain a little bit glossy, a little bit satin. So we're going to go with the next addition. Give it another 30 seconds. Again, we are doing this to make sure we produce a really strong and stable meringue. Okay, I'm going to add the uh, next tablespoon of sugar, sprinkling it in. On the next tablespoon of sugar. It's getting really pillowy. Still 
turn nice and glossy. And our next tablespoon, I go that in. Just be careful when you're adding your sugar that you don't add it directly onto the ginger, otherwise it's gonna just kind of kick back and spray everywhere. And this is getting thicker and it's starting to look a little bit like a marshmallow puff. Okay, and that's with our last tablespoon going in. And after about 30 seconds, just giving that uh, sugar a chance to get fully mixed in and to dissolve into those egg whites. We're going to turn it up to high volume and we're going to let it go for about a minute or two. So what we're looking for now is a stiff peak. So before we had a soft peak. So we still have a soft peak. Those peaks are sort of falling over on themselves. And what we want is a stiff peak so that when we lift our beater out, those peaks are going to stand straight up. So we need to give it about a minute uh, on high speed. Stop your mixture as often as you need to to check. There's no harm in stopping the mixer, checking the peak to see where you are and turning it back on. Now you can overbeat it. And you'll know that you've overbeaten it if it starts to become really uh, uh, separated a little bit, cloud-like a little bit, it'll become a, a dull in color instead of shiny. So if you're doing it in a tabletop mixer, just make sure you don't want to. Keep both sides, keep an eye on it. When you're doing it with a handheld mixer, that should do it. Oh, still a little bit soft there. So got a little bit of a, a curve over on itself. So we're gonna give it just a little bit longer. They're there for your information, and this is true with any recipe. They're there for your information. Baking is all about using your senses and looking for visual cues. So our visual cue right now is a split cue. So if that's a minute, you don't have a split cue. Just keep mixing until you see that split cue. If you don't have that stiff peak within a minute, it's not that anything's gone wrong, um, but eggs are different, environments are different, mixers are different, um, and all of those variables can mean that it's gonna take you a little bit more time or a little bit less time. Okay, and that's what we're looking for. That peak is standing straight up. So the next thing, and this is optional, you don't have to color your mixture at all, but if you do color your mixture, you wanna use a gel food coloring. Gel food coloring is highly, highly concentrated. And that's great for this because it means we're not gonna have to add very much. You don't wanna use um, just a, a typical food coloring that you might find at the grocery store because you're gonna have to use a lot more of that food coloring to get a good saturation out of your meringue. But a gel food coloring, uh, just two or three drops is all it's gonna take to give us a good color in here. So this is, this is Chef Master brand, and this is a really good brand. Um, you can find it in some baking supply stores, and you can definitely find it online. And I'm using a teal green, and you can use whatever color you want. So we're gonna do, I'm gonna do two drops. So one, two. And then I'm just gonna turn my mixer back on to get that incorporated. Okay, if you 
still see some streaks of white. We're gonna add our dry ingredients next and it's all gonna get mixed together. I just wanna get the last of my meringue off of my feeders. So now I'm going to add half of this mixture into my meringue and I'm just going to eyeball it. A little bit more, a little bit less, not the end of the world. I'm just going to put about half of that in there and I'm going to mix this together and I'm not using any special technique here. I'm just going kind of slowly so that I don't stir too hard and force it out of the bowl. And you want to do this by hand. If you're using a stand mixer, you don't want to do this in the mixer. You definitely want to do it by hand. The mixer is just too strong and it's going to deflate your meringue just a little too much. So just getting this stirred in. I want this to look homogenous. Don't want to see any streaks of that um, almond flour powdered sugar mixture in there. And I don't want to see, at this point, I don't want to see any white meringue. Everything should be whatever color you added. I'm just going to Turn this over on itself. I've got a little bit of white down there. Stir this together a little bit more. All right, clean off the sides of my bowl. Clean off the spatula. Now we're good for the second half of our dry mixture. Again, this is just gonna go right on top. And now I'm going to be more delicate with the mixture. I'm gonna start folding it in. And folding is a mixing technique. Um, where you're just using the wrist of your hand. So my spatula is going all the way down to the bottom of the bowl. I'm gonna keep it on the bottom of the bowl, bring it up the side, and then when I get to the top, just sort of rotate it a little bit. And then every time I bring my spatula up, I'm gonna rotate my bowl just a little bit. So I'm right-handed, and I'm using my left hand to turn the bowl. Obviously, if you're left-handed, you're gonna do the opposite. Okay, we don't want any sort of like chicken wing going here. No big sweeping motions with the spatula. It really should be all in your wrist. And try to keep your elbow just right at your side and do everything with your wrist. Your wrist is weak. There's not a lot of strong muscles in here. So it's gonna ensure that you're not over mixing or, or um, using too much force on your meringue. So again, that spatula is going right down to the middle, coming up the side. When I get to the top, just giving a little bit of a fold over, turning the bowl every time that spatula comes up. Okay, we're almost there. Got just a little bit of that dry mixture left. I'm gonna check and make sure I don't have any meringue pockets or dry mixture pockets. I'm gonna go ahead and scrape down the sides. And I'm gonna flip it over on itself to make sure nothing's hiding out at the bottom. I'm gonna do that a couple of times. Got a little bit of dry stuck to the side of my mouth there. Get that incorporated. Okay, so here we are. It's pretty thick. We're ready for the final mixing step. And the French give this a, a specific name. It's called macronage. So we've got everything mixed in, and now we wanna deflate the mixture a little bit. I know, I know, I talked a lot about making sure we made a very stable meringue, making sure we have a, a smaller bubble structure, taking all the necessary precautions to make sure we have a nice, strong, stable meringue, and now we're gonna deflate it a little bit. So when we get to this step, uh, we're gonna beat it just a little bit with our spatula, because what we're going for is sort of a, a lava-like consistency. And right now, we don't have that. See how it just sort of plops down off of my spatula? So if we deflate it a little bit, it's gonna make it um, a little bit looser. So we're gonna beat it uh, about five times. One, two, three, four, five. And then we're gonna check the consistency. Not much difference. I'm gonna clean down the sides of my bowl. We're gonna do that again. One, two, three, four, five. Check the consistency. Right, still a plop, but it 
took its time. It fell a little bit more slowly. So clean down the sides of the bowl. Let's do that again. One, two, three, four, five. And every time you do this, that batter is going to get a little bit more shiny. And it's going to become a little bit more runny. And you want to see it sort of flow off of the end of your spatula. Try that again. One, two, three, four, five. Very close. Got a, like a little break happening right there. It's going to kind of flow down and then broke a little bit there. So just a couple more and I think we're going to be there. One, two, three. Lift that up. Yep. And watch that fall off of the spatula. Now it will come to a point where it breaks because there's just not that much batter left on your spatula. So get a big spoonful and let that flow down. Okay, that's what you're going for. And stop. If you're not sure, let a little bit flow off the spatula and it's gonna settle on top and sort of pile up. Give it about 30 seconds. And after that 30 seconds is up, where it was piled up before, it should have settled down and um, look like the rest of the mixture. It's gonna be nice and flat. It won't be mounded up anymore. It'll be flat and it'll look just like uh, the rest of the mixture or the batter that's in the bowl. So this has been about 15 seconds. Uh, it's flattened out now. I can still see a couple of the ridges. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that. A couple of the ridges where it was, but for the most part, it's flat. So this is ready. And remember, we still have to get it into the bag and we still have to pipe it. So uh, those two steps are going to deflate the mixture a little bit more as well. So if you're going to err on the side of caution, err on the side of um, not deflating it enough. Leave it a little bit on the thicker side if you're a little bit nervous. And macarons is just one of those things you're going to have to make them a handful of times. The first couple of ones are going to taste delicious, but they might not be the prettiest looking. Uh, but the more you make them, the better and the better they're going to get. So I've set up a tray here. Uh, I have a rimmed baking sheet. This is called a half sheet pan. So if you go into a baking store, baking supply store, or you're going online um, and you ask for or search for a half sheet pan, this is what you're going to get. They're always going to be the same size. They're 18 inches by 13 inches. This is what I use for all of my baking. And I've lined it with two of the templates. So I printed out two copies of the template and I've just laid them out on my baking tray. They're gonna have to overlap just a little bit in the center, but that's fine. And then I'm gonna place my silicone baking mat on top. If you don't have a silicone baking mat, you can just use some parchment paper. Okay, so my baking tray is set up. Now let's get our batter into a bag. I have a large piping bag here. Uh, this one is 18 inches. If you have a 12 inch piping bag, that's gonna work too. Uh, you're just gonna have to pipe about half of the batter and then refill your bag. This large bag is gonna allow us to just get everything in here um, and pipe. I have my tip and you don't uh, strictly need to use a tip you can also just cut a hole in the bottom of your bag. If you don't have piping bags at home, or you can't imagine another scenario where you use a piping bag, you can use a zip top bag. Uh, they're not gonna be as tapered at the corner um, as the piping bag is, so they're um, a little bit clumsy to handle, but if that's what you have at home, use that, that's fine. You don't have to go out and get pastry bags if you're not gonna use them for anything else. So I put my tip in the bottom. I haven't cut a hole yet. I'm gonna make a cuff in my bag. So I'm gonna fold over the top third of my bag. Whenever you're filling a pastry bag, you always wanna do this, because you're always, uh, when you're filling a pastry bag, you're always gonna only fill it two thirds of the way full um, so that it's comfortable for you to hold it in your hand and there's not any uh, chance of that batter coming up the top of the bag while you're squeezing out the bottom. So again, I'm right-handed. I'm holding the bag in my left hand and I have that cuff folded over my left hand and I'm making sure that my uh, pointer finger is on top here because I'm going to use that to scrape my spatula as I fill my bag. 
You can also just get a, a big glass and put this inside the glass and it'll almost act as a third hand for you. So I'm gonna get a big scoop. I'm gonna scrape that off onto my finger. With a big scoop, scrape that off to my finger and just repeat until all of my batter is in the bag. Now, again, remember, if you're using a smaller bag or a zip top bag, you may not get all of your filling or all of your batter into your bag in one shot, and that's fine. You just wanna make sure that if you're using a smaller bag, once half of your batter is in there, cover the remaining batter that's in your bowl with a piece of plastic wrap so that it doesn't dry out, and that plastic wrap should touch the surface of the batter, not just cover the bowl, but actually touch the surface of the batter. Got one more little scoop here. Two little scoops here. Okay. And I'm gonna unfold the cup of my bag. I'm gonna lay it nice and flat. Here's where the seams of my bag are. There's a little pastry hack for you. I'm gonna take a just a bowl scraper, the flat end of the bowl scraper, and I'm gonna push that batter all the way down to the end. Okay, still, I don't have a hole cut in my bag. I'm gonna get the, um, get the bag twisted closed. So I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna twist the bag in my right hand. Now the job of my thumb and my forefinger are to hold that twist closed. That's all my thumb and my forefinger are gonna do. And then my three fingers are gonna wrap around the bag here, and the bulk of the bag is sitting in the palm of my hand, and these three fingers are gonna do all of the squeezing. My thumb and my forefinger, their job is just to hold this twist closed so that as I squeeze, the batter goes down and not up through the top, okay? And once your bag is ready, I'm gonna take a pair of scissors, just right along, like maybe about half an inch down from the top of the tip. I'm gonna squeeze the scissors around the tip and rotate. And then that plastic tip is just gonna come right off. Finally, we're ready to pipe. I'm gonna get the bag, or I'm gonna get my tray right in front of me. I'm gonna twist the bag so that there's a good amount of tension or pressure inside the bag. Again, my thumb and my forefinger are holding that twist closed. These three fingers are gonna wrap around. Now I'm gonna uh, invert the bag so that it's standing straight up and I'm gonna hold my tip just above, uh, just above my silk hat or my uh, silicone baking mat here. And there's a, an outline of the macaron size on the template and I'm gonna stop just shy of that round, that outer round. Okay, so vertical, I'm gonna use my three fingers to squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. I'm just shy of that outline. I've stopped squeezing, I'm not squeezing anymore. I'm gonna just sort of flick my wrist, wrist and trace an O on the top, and that's gonna get rid of the tail of my macaron. So I'm just above the bag, squeeze, 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 I'm just stopping shy of the outer part of the circle, stop squeezing, sort of trace an O, give my wrist a little bit of a flick. So squeeze, 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 stop squeezing, flick. Squeeze, 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 stop squeezing, flick. I'm gonna continue this motion until I have all of my macarons piped. Now these are gonna spread a little bit more, so that's why I'm stopping just shy of that uh, outer part of the circle. And I started at the top of my tray and then I'm working towards me rather than starting closer to you and working your way outward. Um, you don't want to drag your pa uh, pastry bag or piping bag through something that you've already piped. So you're always going to start furthest away from you and then work towards yourself. Squeeze, 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 stop squeezing, flick my wrist. Squeeze, 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 stop squeezing, flick my wrist. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. 
and I'm going to evaluate what I've already done. So by the time I got down to this one, these first couple that I've piped have already started, started to flatten out. So that's just my visual cue that I know that I mixed the batter well, because as I worked my way this way, these have started to sort of level out and flatten a little bit. Squeeze, 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 flick, squeeze, 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 flick. Just a couple more here. This is going to give you two sheet trays. these on the side here. Okay, and then this will be for your second tray. Now we need to get our template from underneath the silk hat or parchment paper, whichever you're using. So in my right hand, I'm going to hold the edge of this silk hat in place while my left hand grabs this piece of paper and pulls it out. And I'm going to rotate the tray. So right hand is holding the silk hat in place or parchment paper. Left hand is going to pull that template out. And then once they're piped, we need to release any additional air bubbles that are in our macaron. So you can do a couple of different things. You can grab a kitchen towel and sort of fold that up. Make sure you're holding um, your parchment paper or your silicone mat down with your thumbs, you're going to give it some taps on the counter, rotate it the other way, and you can see some of these, like a little air bubble popped in them. Give it a couple of taps on the other way. You can also use your hand, make sure you're holding down your silk hat or your parchment paper, and just bang it with your hand several times, and do that on both sides. But that's just going to pop any bubbles that are in there and it's going to help those macarons get nice and flat. Okay, after they're piped, we need to let them sit. So this is a good time to preheat your oven. We're going to preheat it to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, once the macarons are ready, as soon as they go in the oven, we're going to reduce the temperature to 275. Um, I'll explain more about that in a minute. Uh, but first, you want to let your macarons dry out a little bit. So right now, this batter is pretty sticky. So if I dip my finger in the top of it, it's gonna stick. Just get this to flatten back out here. But as they sit here, they're gonna form a skin on top of them. And you'll see that they change from sort of shiny like this and uh, to a little bit more dull on top. And that skin is, is gonna become unsticky so that when you tap the top of it, it doesn't stick to your finger the way that this has. And just depending on the temperature and how dry it is inside your kitchen. This can take anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes. So we're just going to keep an eye on these. And when they're ready, we're going to put them in the oven. And that skin on top is what's going to help create um, that foot along the bottom of our macaron. So as the, these bake, they're going to rise a little bit. And that skin is going to lift up off of the tray, revealing that foot underneath. So this is a very important step and it's why it can be a little bit tricky in the summertime when it's humid outside um, because it can take longer for that skin to form on top of your macarons and it just may take you longer to get there. But you can sort of cheat it a little bit by um, maybe having a fan uh, set up near your kitchen and putting the tray in front of a low fan that's blowing air across the top and that'll get them to dry out a little bit faster for you. So there's another little pastry hack for you. So we're just gonna set these aside and we're gonna start working on our fillings. We're gonna make two different kinds of fillings. Uh, the first one is gonna be a ganache and ganache is just a fancy word for chocolate and butter or chocolate and cream at its most basic and most simple level. Um, it just sounds kind of fancier than chocolate and cream or chocolate and butter. So we're gonna make a chocolate ganache and then I'm also gonna show you how to make a buttercream and we're gonna be making what's called a Swiss meringue buttercream. So when we made our macarons, that's what's, uh, that's what's called a French meringue. 
We had our egg whites in a bowl and we whipped those up with sugar and that's a French meringue. A Swiss meringue uh, is egg whites and sugar, but we're gonna put it over a double boiler to get that sugar to melt. And then we're gonna whip it up and to that we're gonna add our butter and that's how it becomes a Swiss meringue buttercream. And actually that's what we're gonna start with. So here on the recipe, it calls for additional egg whites. Now these don't have to be aged or um, let to dry out the same way that the macarons are. They can just be separated and used right away. So whenever you're separating eggs, uh, it's always best to separate them when they're cold um, so that that yolk doesn't break. If you try to separate a room temperature egg, that yolk is more likely to break on you. So you wanna use um, cold eggs to separate and then let those egg whites come to room temperature before you start making your meringue. So we need four egg whites from large eggs. Um, and I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, the difference between a large egg and an extra large egg or a jumbo egg, but the weight of a large egg is 50 grams and the weight of an extra large egg is 60 grams. And I know that 10 grams doesn't seem like much, but that's 20% larger. So when a recipe calls for a specific um, size of egg, do the best that you can to get the size egg that the recipe calls for. Uh, and if you don't have that size egg, just know that the recipe may be off a little bit because it could be off by 20%. You might be adding 20% more eggs if the recipe calls for large and all you have is extra large, okay? Again, this is why weighing is so important because it's just gonna be consistent. We need um, four egg whites from large eggs, a cup and a half of sugar. We need just a pinch of salt. Again, that's just for flavor. And then two whole sticks of butter. That's why it's called buttercream. You don't have to add flavoring to it. It's gonna be delicious on its own. I'm gonna be using vanilla extract today, but you could use whatever you wanted. A lemon extract, orange extract, almond extract, anything that you wanna add in there, um, you can do that. When you're in the kitchen, you're the boss and you can flavor it however you like. So let's, let's make the meringue. I'm gonna be using an induction burner. So this is my induction burner. Works with magnets. It's gonna heat it up. I'm just gonna turn this on. And I'm gonna let this water come to a boil. And it's really fast. It's only gonna take about a minute. Plus I heated this up um, a little bit beforehand. So we're kind of starting with hot water. I'm gonna grab the bowl from my stand mixer. I'm gonna be using the stand mixer for this one. But you can also do it with a handheld mixer you just wanna put your egg whites in a heat proof bowl. It's gonna sit on top of your pot. This is what I'm gonna be whipping my egg whites in uh, in a few minutes. So I just, I don't see the point in dirtying another bowl. So I'm gonna use the bowl from my stand mixer and it's gonna sit on top. The most important thing is that the bottom of your bowl isn't touching the water. So when you're making a double boiler, you really only want about a couple inches of water uh, in the bottom of your pot so that there's a lot of space between the bottom of your bowl and that water. Um, what's heating the egg whites is actually the steam from the water and not the water itself. Not the water itself. The water is much hotter than the steam is. So this is already at a boil. So I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the temperature just to maintain a simmer. Okay, that looks good. So here are my egg whites. I've already scaled out my sugar and I added my salt to the sugar as well. So this is gonna go into my egg whites. I'm just going to whisk everything together before I place it on the double boiler. And this is gonna look pretty thick to start. But as we whisk, that sugar is gonna to start to melt and the mixture is gonna thaw, or not thaw, it's gonna thin out. You just wanna keep everything moving. You don't have to be vigorous here. I'm using a whisk, but you could also use a rubber spatula. We just wanna make sure that the mixture isn't sitting in the bowl um, because it could cook. And scrambled egg whites inside of a buttercream just doesn't sound delicious. So you just wanna keep it moving. Again, it doesn't have to be vigorous. 
And we're just gonna mix this until that sugar dissolves. And you can almost hear it. So baking is really about using a lot of our senses. So I can hear that it's gritty. I can hear the whisk on the sugar and it sounds gritty to me. And then as that sugar melts, that sound is gonna change. And the more you bake, the better you get at that sort of thing. Really using your senses to sort of build up a baking intuition. Baking is like anything else. The more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. And it does take practice. Nobody is just like a naturally good baker. I know I wasn't. I went to pastry school uh, to become a pastry chef. And none of us were naturally good bakers. We made things many, many times. We practiced piping many, many times. So the first several times you make macarons, they may be different sizes. They may not be perfectly round. And that's okay. The more you pipe, the more consistent your shape is gonna be. And it doesn't matter what they look like because they're gonna be delicious. And that's the most important thing. I'm just gonna check and make sure I'm not whew, really boiling there. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this down. We just need to maintain a simmer. That steam is gonna be enough to melt the sugar. And we're going for a temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit of this mixture. And I do have a thermometer here. So right now I'm at a temperature of 133, 134, 135. This just needs about another minute. But this mixture has changed quite a bit. It looks almost like cream or like melted ice cream. It's a little bit thick but it's a lot thinner than when we started out with just our egg whites and sugar. And I can't hear that grittiness as much inside the bowl. I think we're probably there. Let's see. Make sure if you're taking the temperature or when you're taking the temperature, you're also stirring. You don't want those eggs to scramble. And then make sure that the tip of your thermometer is not touching the bowl. Okay, so if the tip of your thermometer is touching the bowl, you're going to get a little bit of a, or not a little bit, you're going to get a false read because the bowl is going to be much hotter than the mixture inside. Okay, 139, 139 and a half. That's gonna be good. Go ahead and turn this off. Okay, so I'm gonna throw this on the stand mixer. So it's a lot more liquidy on the inside. It's flowing freely from the whisk and that sugar has melted. I'm gonna use the whisk attachment and I'm gonna do this again on medium speed because as this meringue whips, I want a really stable meringue. So I want that structure of smaller bubbles rather than a structure of larger bubbles. And then that just needs to go until it has cooled down. The next step is that we're gonna add our butter. And I have my butter ready. This is the two sticks and I just cut them into tablespoon sized pieces. Um, so if we add this too soon to that meringue mixture and the meringue is hot, it's just gonna melt the butter. And the melting temperature of butter is 83 degrees 
Fahrenheit. And I know that sounds really nerdy and that you may not need to know that, but just remember that body temperature is 98 degrees. And so if the melting temperature of butter is 83 degrees, you want to make sure that that meringue doesn't feel warm to the touch whatsoever. It should feel cool to the touch. Um, because body temperature is 98 degrees, and if you're touching something that's 83 degrees, it's going to feel cool to the touch. Not cold, obviously, um, but that's sort of your uh, feel test for it. And if you want, you can absolutely stick a thermometer in there, but just know that it should not feel warm to the touch whatsoever. If it does, it's going to melt your butter. So this is unsalted butter, because remember I added salt to the sugar when we were mixing everything together. And it should be room temperature. It should be nice and soft. You should be able to just press your finger into it, but it shouldn't be so soft that it's melting your rice. And then while that's cooling the room, we're going to jump to the next recipe, which is our ganache. Get my counter things up here. Let's check our macaron shells. So it's been maybe about 10 minutes or so. You're getting there. The edge over here is not as sticky, but it's still sticking in my finger. Just a little bit. I think this needs probably about five or ten minutes. And I have my macarons far away from my oven. They're not sitting on top of my oven, they're not sitting next to the oven. They're all the way over here on the counter. My stove is just right through behind me, so I have them sitting all the way over here on the counter, making sure that it's not too warm uh, while they're drying. So for our ganache, I have 85 grams or three ounces of chocolate. I have 30 grams of unsalted butter, room temperature. 15 grams of light corn syrup, and then again, just a pinch of salt. So when you're buying chocolate, and you're in the baking aisle at the grocery store, uh, Try to avoid a baking chip, you know, the type of chip that you would put into a chocolate chip cookie because there are stabilizers in that chocolate and that's what helps keep um, chocolate, helps a chocolate chip keep its shape when it bakes so it doesn't melt into the cookie, right? You put a chocolate chip into a cookie, goes into the oven, comes out, it's still a chocolate chip. So those stabilizers can sometimes make um, if you're melting them, make it a little bit blocky or stiff. If that's all you have at home, that's totally fine to use. But I want to encourage you to buy um, either a bar of chocolate in the baking aisle. And there's lots of good brands. Um, Guitar is a good brand. Ghirardelli uh, is a good brand. Um, so buy a bar of chocolate uh, if you can. Or what I used is uh, in this bag here. You a good look at that. It's from a company called IFI Provisions. You can go to ifiprovisions.com, it's a website. And what's really great about this company is that the parent company is actually for professionals like myself. It's just, I used to use them to order you know, all of my chocolate and decor when I was working in a pastry shop, except the chocolate would come in 25 pound bags. So they created IFI provisions for the home baker like yourself so that you can get chocolate in a one pound bag instead of 25 pounds, but it's really good quality of chocolate, it's really good quality ingredients. We're not paying you to say this, I just think for the home baker, it's a really fun website to get really great ingredients. I'm using a 64% chocolate, that's a bittersweet chocolate, so you want to use some, uh, for this recipe, something between 55% and 65%, and that's going to be a bittersweet chocolate. So I put this over a double boiler. I just got some warm water in here, just like we did for the meringue, to melt this. You can also do it in the microwave. Everything goes into the bowl, and then it can, it's going to go into the microwave in a 15 to 20 second intervals. And you're going to stop the microwave, stir it, put it back in the microwave for 15 to 20 seconds, 
stop the microwave, stir it, and you're gonna keep doing that until everything's melted. Chocolate is very, very susceptible to burning. It burns very easily. So you don't wanna just put it in the microwave for a minute and come back to it. You want to do it in those short intervals and let that chocolate melt slowly. Or you can do it over a double boiler like this. And you just want everything to be melted. Once it's melted, we're going to stir it together. Actually, I'm going to stir it through this. I'm going to whisk this together just until it's smooth. You can also add flavoring to this as well. Peppermint extract would be delicious. Vanilla, vanilla and chocolate work so well together. A coffee extract would be great. Coffee inside the chocolate doesn't make it tastes like coffee, it makes the chocolate taste more like chocolate. A lot of chocolates have sort of an undertone of coffee to them, and when you add coffee extract to the chocolate, it just makes it taste even more chocolatey. Just want to whisk it together until it's smooth and shiny. Now, we can't pipe this right now, it's hot or it's warm. Uh, and so it's pretty liquidy. If we tried to put this into a macaron shell right now, it would just sort of spill over the edges. So it needs to cool down, but it's a little bit of a game. If it cools down too much, it's going to solidify and it's going to be hard to pipe. And if it doesn't cool down enough, you can't pipe it because it's too soft. So you have to get the timing just right. I would recommend making the ganache give you about 15, 20 minutes before you are going to pipe them into your macarons. So your macarons should be made um, right out. It should be baked and the macaron shell should cool completely uh, before you fill them. So once you've gone through all of those steps, then I would go ahead and make your ganache and then let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes until it cools down and get to the right position. I'm going to put this into a piping bag. Now I have a smaller piping bag here. This is a 12 inch piping bag. This is going to help it cool down a little bit faster. Just scrape all of this down. So again, I've made that cup on my bag where I've folded the top third of my bag down over my hand. I'm going to open the inside of the bag so that there's a nice big opening in there. Now I'm working with a bowl that has a coin spout on it. And this is liquidy, nice and liquidy, so I'm just going to pour it in. Use my finger to scrape off the edge of my bowl. This is actually where a little cup would come in really handy. You just put your bag right in a little cup and it gives you a third hand. Or, if you're doing this with a partner in the kitchen, you can have two this. It's great for two people. Okay. I'm going to unfold my bag. Just going to give it a couple of twists at the top. And then I'm just going to let it sit on my counter. So what I've done here is I've made it a lot thinner in the bath than it was in the bowl, and the bowl was a lot thicker. So it's going to take longer to cool if it's thicker. So I'm just going to put it in the bag and leave this on the countertop. Um, you could also put it in like an 8 by 8 baking dish um, and get it in really thin layer, and that'll get it cool down really quickly as well. Put my hands down here, and then I think my meringue is ready, so let's check it. So look at this. It's gotten really, really thick and fluffy and voluminous. My bowl's not warm. Remember, it should feel just slightly cool to the touch. Perfect. So I'm going to put this back on the mixer and back on that medium speed. And I'm just going to add a tablespoon of butter at a time and let that get all the way mixed in before I add the next tablespoon of butter.
And I'm going to do this on high speed. I'm going to stop it several times and show you what the mixture looks like on the inside and talk about some troubleshooting if necessary. <laughs> So this is about half of my butter mixture. So you want to stop it periodically and scrape down the sides because that butter is going to attach itself to the side of the bowl. So you can use a rubber spatula. I'm just using the whisk here to sort of scrape everything down. And then we'll keep adding our butter. Before I add the next half of my butter, I'm going to just check our macaron shells here. Okay, so that's what you want. You want to be able to touch the top and not have any of that macaron batter stick to your finger. And test several. Don't just test one. I'm not pushing hard. I don't want my finger to go all the way down to the top of the silk pad or anything like that. I just, I'm barely tapping the top of them just to make sure that it's not gonna to stick to my finger, okay? These are ready to bake. So I have my oven already preheated at 300 degrees. I'm gonna put these in. Um, I've just got the one tray here, but again, it's gonna make two trays. So you want uh, a rack at the top, and then you want a rack in the middle. Uh, and you're gonna put your two trays in. You're gonna lower the temperature to 275 degrees. You're gonna bake them for seven minutes. And then after seven minutes, you're gonna rotate the trays and you're gonna switch their positions inside the oven and then go for another seven to 11 minutes. And I'll just set my timer for seven minutes. I'm just gonna flip my bag of ganache over to get the other side to cool down. And now we'll go back to our meringue. Again on high speed, and I'm just gonna add a tablespoon of the butter at a time. Incorporated. Again, I'm just gonna scrape the sides down again. And right now, this looks like it's way too soft to pipe. And it is. We're gonna let this continue mixing for several minutes on high speed, and you're gonna see everything come together.
You want to stop the mixer periodically and just scrape down the sides. feels a little bit warm to me. I'm going to just pop it in my refrigerator for a couple of minutes while I'm letting my meringue finish to get it cooled down. So now comes the magic of TV part. So I have some macaron shells that have already baked and cooled. Because the ones that we just put in the oven, there's not going to be enough time for those to bake and then cool so that we can fill them. So I have some already ready for us to go. So after they've cooled all the way, I've taken all of the shells off of my silicone baking mat using, um, using an offset, using an offset spatula. Just kind of go under that cookie and release them from the silk pad. You can also peel them away. If you don't have an offset spatula, you can just use your hands and peel them off. Now, if your macarons are not coming off cleanly from either your parchment paper or your silicone baking mat, one of two things is happening. Either the cookie needed to bake a little bit longer, and I'm going to talk about um, what to check for, you know, when the cookies are baked uh, long enough. So for sticking, it either needed to bake longer or the um, macaron mixer was over mixed and it became just a little too loose, a little too, uh, a little too deflated. But for sticking, it's usually one of those two issues. They're still going to be delicious and they're absolutely fixable. You're just going to take that tray, you're going to put it into your freezer, let them freeze for like 30 or 45 minutes. Once they're frozen, they're going to peel off really, really nicely from your parchment or your silicone baking mat. And then you can just proceed. So as you're piping more and becoming more consistent with your piping, uh, you're going to have different sizes of macarons. And so what you're going to do is you just want to match them up so that you have the same size cookie on the top and the bottom. So you just take the cookies and place them on top uh, of each other and then just make sure that they're the same size and then I'm going to leave one uh, with the bottom facing up and one with the bottom facing down and I've got them lined up in a nice row so I'm going to put my filling in here and then top them off and then put my filling here and top them off. Let me check my dinner. Almost. Now let's check our buttercream. It's really, you can see what I'm doing. It's really thickened up. Needs just a little bit longer on the mixer. At this point, I'm going to add my flavoring, which is going to be vanilla. Vanilla is actually my favorite flavor of macaron. Whenever I go into a bakery that sells macarons, I always get the vanilla and then another flavor. I just sort of compare all of the different vanilla macarons. So we're gonna put about a teaspoon. I just use the cap of the bottle to measure it. A little bit more, a little bit less. It's not going to hurt anything. And it's really the extract that you add is really subjective to how you like it. If you like it flavored a little bit um, more soft, then you can add less. If you like a more strong flavor, then you can add more.
Okay, this is the right consistency for us now. Just gonna turn that down to a medium speed while we keep uh, fill a couple of these macarons. I'm gonna go ahead and cut a hole in my bag. And you can use a piping tip here. We could do a little bit more control, but I do wanna show you that you don't have to use a tip. So again, my thumb and my forefinger are building the twist of the bag close. The bulk of the bag is sitting in the palm of my hand, and then these three fingers are gonna do all of the squeezing. And again, I'm going to start furthest away from me and work down. And you want to make it uh, when you're filling them. Uh, you don't want to have the filling go all the way to the edge because when we put the top on, we're going to smush it down a little bit. And you don't want your filling going over the edge once you smush it down. So I'm squeezing, 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 stop squeezing, and then you can just lift up. When you go to put the top on, I'm going to place the top on and then just twist it slightly as I push it. If your ganache got too firm, you can put it in the microwave four or five seconds at a time until it softens up. So I'm putting that top on, pushing down and slightly twisting at the same time. And now for our meringue, it's really thickened up. It looks like a proper frosting now. Whenever you have a recipe that has a lot of butter in it, like this does, remember it was two sticks of butter, it can break on you. And what that means is it's almost going to look curdled for lack of a better word, it's not gonna be smooth. Um, if that happens to you, you can just apply a little bit of heat to the mixture to bring that emulsion back together. Um, if you have a little um, like creme brulee torch in your kitchen, that's great to just um, sort of flash it on the side of the bowl like a couple of seconds. Um, or you can take out about half of a cup uh, of the buttercream and put it in a small microwave safe bowl and put it in the microwave for about five or 10 seconds until it gets really soft, almost melted and put that back in the bowl and that little bit of warm melted buttercream will be enough to warm up uh, what's left in the mixture. And that heat along with more whipping will bring it back together. So I'm gonna grab my other bag here. Again, I'm making that cup. And I'm using my finger to scrape off my spatula. And unfold the bag. I'm gonna go ahead and cut a small hole. Thumb and forefinger are holding that closed. And I'm going to squeeze, pipe, 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 stop, squeeze, 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 stop. Now, before I put the 
tops on my macarons. I want to check the macarons that are in the oven. They're not done yet. I do want to show you what's happening. Here they are. I'm going to rotate the tray. You can see that the feet are just starting to form on here. They won't be fully formed yet, so don't panic, but rotate your trays and put them back in the oven. And I'm going to set the timer for another seven minutes and then we'll check them. Now, when you're checking your macarons to see if they're ready, when they're on the tray, you're going to take your finger and you're going to try to wiggle the top of it. And if the cookie wiggles back and forth, it's not done. It needs more time in the oven. If you put your finger on top to try to wiggle the top of the cookie and it's stable and it doesn't move, then your cookies have finished baking and they're ready to come out of the oven. So just depending on your oven, how big you piped your macaron, um, it could take anywhere from an additional seven to 12 minutes. So in the oven for seven minutes and then you're gonna rotate your trays and then switch them from the top rack to the middle rack and then another seven to 12 minutes. Uh, I always set the timer for seven minutes and check them and then add additional time if needed. Now we'll cap off our vanilla macarons here. So this filling is thicker. So as I push down, sort of push it back and forth. Now, you can absolutely eat these now, but traditionally, macarons are aged before they're eaten, which gives a chance for the filling and the cookie to sort of meld together in flavor. So traditionally, this tray would get wrapped all the way in plastic and it would go into the freezer, freezer for 24 hours, um, and then the macarons could be brought to room temperature and eaten. And I know that's really hard. It's hard to wait a full day after you've made them to eat them. Um, so you can go ahead and eat them just as they are. Any uh, macarons that you're gonna store, make sure they go in an airtight container and into the fridge. They'll last for about two to three days, just depending on how liquidy um, your filling is. They're gonna get softer over time. Um, so just keep that in mind that any leftovers, when you store them in the refrigerator or on the counter, I don't recommend storing them on the counter, uh, but they are gonna get softer over time. And then just let them come to room temperature before you enjoy them. It's gonna be delicious now, so I say just dive right in. It's chewy, it's crispy. It's perfect. So I hope that you try these at home. Remember to tag the library if you do. Tag me as well, at Sweet Bee Chicago. Happy baking, everyone. Enjoy. Bye.